Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is my New York. It is not often I get to welcome rock stars to this program, but today is special. Dr. Carmen Bombach is a supernova of the art world, an internationally recognized expert on the Italian Renaissance and renowned Leonardo da Vinci scholar. And she's just published her magnum opus, a four-volume monograph, 24 years in the making, entitled Leonardo da Vinci Rediscovered, marking the 500th anniversary of his death. Carmen Bombach is here to share her discoveries Next. Carmen Bombach, it is my honor to have you on this program. Um, uh, and I should, of course, mention a, a yet another of your credentials. You are a curator of drawings and prints at the Metropolitan Museum and have been in that role for what? Since 1995, I think. That's right. So Almost as long as well, uh, that I have been writing on well, Leonardo. Yes, exactly, 24 years. You've poured a lifetime of scholarship into this magnificent work, the, these four volumes, and I was, I was charmed to hear, to see you refer to it as your night job, as an as a art historian. Talk about that a little. Well, during my day, I do all the curatorial responsibilities. That includes also lots of research, doing exhibitions, doing acquisitions, then managing, of course, a collection at the Met. So even during my day job, I've mounted quite a few exhibitions. Yes, I think so. With their publications. Including the uh, magnificent show that's on now at the Met, St. Jerome, uh, Praying yes. in the Wilderness. We'll come back to that. But anyway, right. so your night job has been to work on this, <laughs> on this work uh, on Leonardo. So, of course, I didn't start out thinking that I would be writing four volumes on Leonardo. And I'm sure my publisher, Yale University Press, did not want that or even anticipate it. This grew as a kind of labor of love. Uh, I suppose I can make the analogy to motherhood. No mm -hmm. one sets out to have quadruplets. <laughs> not, not often. And, no. oh, that's right. And so uh, basically what happened is that I very much believe in this biographical approach to figures of history. I mean, after all, I feel very strongly that biography informs who we are, so why mm -hmm. not inform the way that artists are? And it was in this sort of process of documenting Leonardo's life as well as his works and how it all fits that you end up with four volumes. Was there a specific impetus for you to, to, to begin this? I mean, you're, you're, bit, you're a Leonardo scholar, and I, I assume you looked to the future and said, gee, in, 19, in 2019 it'll be 500 years. But was there some specific imp impetus to... Uh, undertaking this? 2019 was an accident as the publication. We had always <laughs> hoped that the book would come out much sooner. But it all began when I uh, organized the exhibition at the Met, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 2003. It was an exhibition entitled Leonardo da Vinci, Master Draftsman. So mm -hmm. in bringing together those 144 works, it gave me a sense of like having the laboratory to explore. And it was interesting because that was when I completely rethought what I was doing as a researcher of Leonardo da Vinci's work. And it was really interesting to see that the only way for me, at least as a scholar, to go forward was to explore this biographical account. In other words, it was the only way to uh, describe how he develops as a thinker, as a person, uh, considering his family history seemed to me really important because after all, he was left-handed. Mm -hmm. uh, he was also illegitimately born. And so to me, this seemed like something that was going to be worthwhile at least pulling it together into this larger understanding of Leonardo. Well, as the title of the book says, you rediscovered him, and I, and I want to come back to that and, and explore it a lot more with you. 
But first, I want you to tell me a story. You're a senior at Yale, majoring in art history. You see a drawing by Michelangelo that is the art world at that point believes is, is an armpit, that he's, it's a, it's Oh my a, God, you're bringing this up. This I is want, really I want you to tell you, you, I want you to tell that story. This woman, as a senior in, you know, in her salad days, <laughs> she's still in her salad <laughs> days. But anyway, tell the story. Let me not interrupt you. Well, um, I was very interested in writing this uh, senior thesis about Michelangelo's Sistine ceiling, and it was kind of kooky. I wanted to explore how the Sistine ceiling compositionally follows sort of arrows of energy, and that there was this sense of potential energy that really showed us how Michelangelo conceived this ever-evolving narrative to culminate on the mm -hmm. altar. So in order to also do my work in discovering all this and trying to articulate this, I was looking through books on Michelangelo's drawings, and so I wanted to see all the drawings, and I come across this photograph of a drawing, and I read that it says it's an armpit, and I go, well, no, this, this is published upside down. You turn around yeah, the I mean, photograph. How, how did that hit you right away? I mean, because I had studied, I had wanted to be a visual artist, and since I was a kid, basically, I used to draw after the old masters. My parents, bless their hearts, uh, when I grew up in Chile, would buy me a lot of art books. And mm -hmm. so one of them was Michelangelo, and I would draw after the prophet Haman who has a very foreshortened head in the Sistine ceiling, so draw after that photograph. So I knew pretty, pretty well mm -hmm. what you have to do in order to visualize at the roughest draft what a foreshortened head looks like. So and that's what I saw. And I you're said, just looking at this described as an armpit, and you said, no, Upside no. down. Yeah, yes. I said, no, this is... This is it, Haman. Yes, this, this is you Haman who's turn around, and this really does look like a foreshortened head. And so that's what I said. I published it about two years later as a hypothesis. And then in 1990, in March, when the cleaning of the Sistine ceiling was almost at the conclusion and the restorers were going to start on the Last Judgment, there was actually scaffolding by the side of uh, where Heyman was. So the director of the restoration, uh, Fabrizio Mancinelli, who is, was really a fantastically open person and very encouraging of young people. Remember, I was pretty much well, still a kid. Yeah, you're we, 20, what, three when you published this? Yes. And, and, uh, and we climbed on the... And the director of the, of the uh, restoration, I guess you would call it, at, at the, yes. at the uh, Sistine Chapel buys into your hypothesis, he says, wait a fantastic. minute, this makes sense. Yes, and so we, at the, it was almost 10 years after I published the article as a hypothesis, we climbed uh, on the scaffolding and I had my full scale uh, 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 reproduction, uh, actually a tracing on acetate, and we were able to put it on the figure of Heyman and it fit perfectly. So, yeah, <laughs> it was a pretty good hunch that paid yes. off 10 years later. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it was more than a hunch. I think it's early example of your genius. It all begins, though, with parents who educate you to sort of have a larger horizon. I mean, I, I have to come back to that. Uh, fact, growing up in Chile, where you know we might say there, well, there are no Italian Renaissance works there in the original, so um, that does not mean anything. Your parents kind of open up mm -hmm. the world by feeding you beautiful books and sort of encouraging a an intellectual development, but it has to start when you are a kid. These four volumes um, uh, on Leonardo are, are just uh, incredible. Um, Fifteen, what Thank is it? You. Something like fifteen hundred uh, drawings and images in the four volume. Yeah. What What do you want to talk about about that? I mean, there's so much we could we could talk about. You You were talking earlier about 
um, how you approached it and why you thought to approach him in that way. And I think you've referred to this as your archaeological consideration. But can you make that, uh, it, can you put that in ways that our audience can understand uh, about what you were doing and how you were re-examining Leonardo? I felt, I mean, if I had to sort of redefine the method, I would say it's a biographical, archaeological, and just to explain, if we believe that biography is such an important method, and I really am committed to that, um, of in the case of Leonardo, the information is very scattered, and so, and there are lots of gaps in the evidence, and so that's when the archaeological element comes in to fill in those gaps. Now, it, there, is, there are mountains written about Leonardo, mm -hmm. and what is really interesting is that there are so many myths as well about it. And so one of the things that I really wanted to make sure was how do we separate that which is a concrete documentable fact from a probability, from a possibility, from sheer speculation and pie in the sky idea, which there are many. And interestingly, to me, the most fundamental contribution that I could give back was to show how Leonardo became Leonardo. It's a process of development, it's a process of education, and it's also a process of humanizing the genius, I feel. And in that, in us, we ask different questions. We're opening up the field for the future generations of researchers to study. So that's part of the reason I wanted to call the book Rediscovered, because it's about opening doors, mm -hmm. not so much closing doors. I was going to ask you about the the, the head of a young woman, which is a study for um, for the angel in, in the Virgin on the Rocks. Would that yes. contribute to this? Or? I think, yeah, yes, that study is based on a live model. And so there is an animation that is captured uh, in the drawing. There is also a psychological presence that Leonardo captures in that drawing. And then, of course, there is a mysterious beauty. So as a study that is based on life, and then we look at the figure that corresponds in the painting, and we notice that it is highly idealized. And so what we have seen, therefore, is this process of transformation that uh, Leonardo achieves in the painting. The other aspect in Leonardo's drawings that is really extraordinary, especially those that are of an artistic uh, content, is, are the sketches, the quick sketches. And Leonardo, in fact, also writes about the theory of drawing and painting. And he tells us that the most important thing is to very quickly pour ideas on the paper. And so this idea of sketching, sketching, sketching uh, with the fury of inspiration, as he also mentions, there is a sense of creativity, movement, and spontaneity that spills on the page and that shows us many alternative ideas. I mean, Leonardo writes about semi-consciousness, the moment when you first awake from heavy sleep, that that is the best moment to draw. And so you're fresh. You let yourself sort of express yourself on the on the paper. This was really very revolutionary for the time. Remember that other artists of Leonardo's time or even before would just start drawing a figure and become very committed to that figure. And so it becomes about elaborating and re-elaborating with details and all Well, this. he was never satisfied. I mean, he, he challenged himself. And I think the drawings, as you, as you point out, are, are uh, well, that's where you started your, your, your analysis, your rediscovery of him is with the drawings, because after all, this is a man who's rarely finished anything. I mean, he, he maybe created 20 paintings in his yes. life, and some, some of those not even finished. Yes, and one of the things that I was really interested in is precisely this phenomenon of not finishing. And one of the sort of things that sort of led me into trying to really understand what this was about 
um, was beginning with the drawings. And in looking at the drawings, what became really clear is that Leonardo cherished the moment of discovery on the paper, the moment of uh, work in progress, so always exploring, exploring. And so much of the unfinished in his paintings are about this work in progress. This is kind of the metaphysical state in which Leonardo likes to dwell in as an artist and a thinker. So in a way, this is turning the whole sort of issue of the unfinished into a very positive trait. He simply did not care to finish. And there is a certain will to this. If we think about the artist really being committed to the idea of work in progress. And, and yes, and just so the audience, perhaps those who don't understand, I mean, Leonardo was, was obviously a genius, a perfectionist. He kept exploring, kept, and every time he, he sought the answer to something that he was, you know, it, it would lead to more questions. Right. And this is why he didn't, yeah. this is why he didn't finish. But um, I, wa I want to bring this around to what overall could you say is the Leonardo that you've rediscovered? Who is this guy that maybe is slightly, we are now seeing in a different, perspective because of your work, this, these great four volumes? I think one of the aspects that is really interesting and very important is the extent to which his vision and what was in his mind and what he hoped to accomplish, uh, how much greater that is from what actually got done. In many really? ways, the legacy of Leonardo is this intense intellectual ambition and curiosity. And perhaps this is what speaks to us as uh, modern people the most, this idea that his life and work are a testament to this intellectual search, that that is truly one of the greatest legacies that, of course, it leads to magically beautiful paintings, uh, extraordinary uh, investigation of technology, of uh, mechanics, the anatomical drawings that Leonardo produces, particularly in the period of his maturity, say in 1510, are of such extraordinary subtlety and visual uh, reasoning and visual communication that many of those um, devices that he uses to illustrate anatomy are still used today in anatomical illustration. I mean, no matter whether we've gone to the digital uh, age or not, we still do the lifting of the skin to look at the muscles and all this. And Leonardo and he was gives doing us, that in yes, and exactly. And Leonardo leads us through that methodology. He also tells us that in order to understand anatomy in the best possible way, we need to look at it from eight different points of view, at least. So mm -hmm. that's what the camera does when we uh, employ. The exactly. MRI, yes. Exactly. We understand that he is a man who was an, a, a genius ahead of his time. And it's the mental, it's the sort of psychological approach to these questions. But remember, equally important, he was tied to his time. And probably that is the part that is hardest for us to understand today, is how is he a person of his time? He's a thinker who is committed and actually to a very great extent fettered to the conventions and systems of knowledge of his time. I feel that as a scholar, by having demonstrated that, it allows us also to see in a much clearer way how he transcends his time. We have so little time and so much more I want to talk to you about, but let's see if we can cram at least a couple of things in. Okay. Mona Lisa, give us a quick Okay. Something about the Mona Lisa. I mean, everybody's seen it, whether they've seen it in person or pictures. So what, do you, what do you want to tell us about the Mona Lisa that we don't know? Uh, I think one of the things that is most important about the Mona Lisa is to try to see it as a painting, 
as an object and to forget in many ways the myth for the moment. I had the privilege uh, of being able to spend an entire day with the team at the Musée du Louvre of Conservators examining the Mona Lisa for that entire day. Carmen, it had, was, Carmen has held the Mona Lisa. And that was one of the most extraordinary things. I will never forget that. Seeing how thin the panel of wood that it is painted on, seeing that it really is no larger than this, um, and seeing it as a painting. And so that means that we do not have this somewhat green tone that the glazing gives it inside the case. Um, it is possible to even see some of the changes of mind on the hands of the, the, the outlines on the hands. It changes is also, of Leonardo's changes of, yes, of mind. Well, he, he, I thought I'll do this, but I'm going to do that. Yes, and you can slight see. alterations. Yeah. And the other thing is that one can look at the middle ground of the painting and really see preparation, just the preparation without pigment in, in certain areas. And that middle ground of the picture is very unresolved. So it's clear that the painting um, was not something that he considered fully resolved. The transition from the foreground, the balcony area, and then going into the depth of the, of the landscape. And remember that painting we now know was begun in October 1503. He had it at the time of his death. This mm, painting kept it with him. Yes, this was a portrait. All portraits in the Renaissance were commissioned by a patron. And then, of course, on finishing them, they were delivered. This was never delivered. In fact, many of the paintings um, Leonardo did not seem to have delivered to his uh, yeah. final clients. So it's important to be able to see the Mona Lisa as a work in progress. Uh, that was what fascinated me most. The magnificent exhibit now on at the Metropolitan that you curated of, of St. Jerome praying in the wilderness, this very powerful exhibition which it centers around one painting, perhaps Leonardo's most famous uh, unfinished. Tell us something about, tell us, tell us about the fingerprints you discover. His, Leonardo's fingerprints are on that uh, painting. So the, the painting is probably the most intense, uh, spiritually moving painting that Leonardo produced, at least for a, a private devotion. And the painting, because it's unfinished, it allows us to see Leonardo at work and in the evolution of his ideas. The painting also shows us that Leonardo proceeded in a pretty undisciplined way. He just sort of focused on the parts that were of interest to him. Then he began in 1483, and then he probably picked it up again in 1510 to start, so or decades after he had begun it. And at the time that he had done some of the really detailed anatomical studies of the musculature in around 1510. And so that part of the head, the neck, and the upper part of the shoulders and back, that is the part that he, re -com he completely redid. And then you look at other parts of the painting and you see that the shin, the lower uh, leg of the, the right leg is very finished, looks very sculptural. Then the torso looks almost in shadow, completely uh, unresolved. Um, then you look at the upper left and you see the landscape that Leonardo started applying some pigment. And then, you know, he used his uh, fingers and he used the palms of his hand to blend pigment and create a soft focus. But we should also say that there are fingerprints and sort of the use of the palm in other paintings by Leonardo as well. And that also happens in some other Italian Renaissance paintings. It's not as unusual as we might think. It, it is more of a practical uh, way of uh, artistic creation does engage the entire body. But what is really interesting about and moving about having the fingerprints on that painting is that there is yet another way in which he feels, uh, Leonardo feels very physically close to us, the VOR. And after all, that painting is so much about creating a connection between the viewer and the subject 
being uh, painted. Um, and there, Leonardo writes a great deal about the engagement of the viewer with the subject of the painting. In fact, he says that a viewer, that is we, as the public should feel yes. as moved as the subject that is portrayed in the painting. This is the 500th anniversary of Leonardo's death and in Paris next month there's going to be all kinds of celebrations at the Louvre and I suppose all around Paris and you will be there and what you'll just be you'll just be an observer right? No. <laughs> no. What is your role? So I will be the keynote uh, lecturer. Of uh, course. About uh, it's a symposium dedicated to Leonardo on science, and so that'll be a, a very special thing. Uh, my colleagues at the Musée du Louvre have been great supporters of my work on Leonardo, so it's very uh, sweet, and I feel very honored that I was invited to do that. And I will also be giving the lecture closing the Leonardo year in Paris at the Louvre, mm -hmm. January 11th, 2020. Okay. So um, if you want more of Carmen, and you should, uh, get to Paris because we have to leave it here. I hope you get her <laughs> volumes. Um, I hope you see her wonderful show at the, at the uh, uh, Metropolitan, which closes on October 6th. And I must tell you, uh, it's been extraordinary uh, experience for me. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Tony. It's really my pleasure and honor to be here. Well, thank you. We will see you soon. Thank you. <laughs>